Hello and welcome to the Master Mind, Body, and Spirit Show. I'm your host, Matt Belair. Today's guest is the founder, chairman, and managing partner of Strathsby Crown, a growth equity holding company with a broad portfolio of company and asset holdings spanning healthcare, clean energy, social media, and financial technology. In addition, he is the founder, chairman, and CEO of Crown Sterling Limited, a next generation cryptography company based on discoveries from his work in geometry and mathematics. Welcome back to the show, my friend, Robert Grant. Hey, Matt, how are you? Uh, it's good to see you again, man. It's, it's glad we got this thing started. I think you and I could just chat forever about a variety of topics, but uh, it's amazing to be able to share your incredible work and your wisdom and all that kind of stuff with the world. You know, it's uh, like we were saying at the beginning, you've kind of exploded over the last couple of years, sharing your math and geometry. And it, it's astounding what you're discovering. And, and I just kind of hold on with all my life to try to figure out exactly what you're talking about. But man, it's, it's a fun ride. So it's good to see you again. Good to see you too, my friend. You're, you're looking good and your beard is looking very fresh. Thanks, man. Well, you know, there's a, <laughs> oh, I can't, I can't, the, uh, the Indiana Jones version of you, you know, when you get stuck in Egypt one of these times in the underground and you come out, there's going to be a whole another level of awareness to you. So I know we want to talk a little bit about um, Egypt, alchemy, uh, the Da Vinci Code and, and <clears throat> Michelangelo and all these amazing things you're discovering, but uh yeah, man, you're talking about a lot these days. So where do you want to dive in? Um, we can start where you want to go. So you just take us away. Okay, well, <laughs> so a lot of your stuff comes around uh, sacred geometry, mathematics. I think, you know, if, if people are new to your work, what they might not understand is you have a background in music. Also, you know, seven languages or something like that, right? And one of those languages goes forward and backward. So and then this equates to how you're figuring out math and, and seeing it a whole new way. So I feel like that gives you a very unique perspective on how you're viewing mathematics, but how you also view problems. And so you're also going to Egypt and we went to the, to Egypt together, but you've been back several times making these new discoveries in Egypt, making new discoveries in math, and then also bringing them back to the work of, uh, you know, the code and, and all that kind of thing. So why don't we, why don't we start there? Okay. So, uh, geez. Well, you know, I think a good introduction <laughs> on that will actually be, oh, you need to allow me to, to do a share screen. Okay. Give me one second. I think I got to make you the host. So let me just do that. Um, make host. There you go. It says who can share only host. Uh, you can start sharing when someone else is sharing. So usually I could just go straight up. And, okay, now it's letting me. Okay, cool. So, so I'm gonna, you should be able to see this little screen right here. And yeah. uh, start this over. <laughs> So where do I go to optimize the sound on this? Oh, you're going to want to go um, before you screen share. You might have to start again. You're going to see two buttons at the bottom uh, that are so faint. it's right next to the green thing that says screen share. Yeah, screen share that, and as soon as you click that, it'll right at the very bottom. There's two boxes. Okay. All right. So optimize screen share for video clip. There you go. There you go. Now people get the premium experience. Cool. All right. <laughs> so let's go ahead and do this then. It's asking me to share your computer audio. Please install Zoom audio device. Uh oh. It's telling me I have to install a Zoom audio device. We might have to go with the uh, the regular version audio experience then. Okay. No, it actually looks like it's working. It says your default thing. So let's let's give this a try. So can you see the screen in front of you? Yep. Okay. There's a global renaissance of understanding and awareness happening right now. <clears throat> I want to actually be part of a catalytic change in systemic transformation. People think that there are no miracles, and others think that the entire universe and life is a miracle itself. You can say the same thing about mathematics. People think that mathematics is random. <clears throat> 
Or others might actually say, as I believe, that the only things we call random are those things we haven't discovered the pattern for yet. The pattern exists, we just haven't yet perceived it. It's outside of our realm of intelligence. You can rank order in a way, our ascension or understanding as a species in consciousness by the degree to which we perceive randomness versus pattern. My motivation in life has been just my own inspiration for learning. I'd say that's probably the biggest theme of my entire life. I just have this incredible curiosity to understand why things are the way they are. My career has been a wonderful journey. For the last you know, five years or so, I've changed a lot how I kind of perceive the world around me. I think that the change in perception has probably led to a change in my own experience and in reality. But I'd say the most profound of those shifts has been the incredible self journey that I've basically gone on. I never thought of myself as really someone that might be a mathematician. And I still don't really consider myself a mathematician. I think that mathematics, I look at it very differently now than the way before. Changing our viewpoint of what mathematics is, is the key to unlocking mathematics for us. I see mathematics as a musical and artistic language that is expressed in geometry, where you know, geometry is the sound that we see with our eyes. That's kind of a powerful concept. And when you understand that math is just a language of communication with the universe, then I don't really consider myself a mathematician. I just consider myself a human being who is learning the language of the universe. When we know we've tapped in to this universal kind of consciousness, what happens is it comes out equally balanced between science and art. We need to move out of just this polarized perspective and recognize it's not just black and white color, we have a whole spectrum of color. So there's a whole spectrum of opportunity to see different viewpoints. And that's what geometry does. It expands your viewpoints. If I can help to impart something, only one thing, it would be to Look at the world with rose-colored glasses, and most importantly, look at yourself with rose-colored glasses as well, and recognize that you are great just as you are. We all are. That empowerment can help change the world around you, be the change you want to see in the world. <clears throat> and for the fact, we all are very similar. We all have similar needs. We all want to be loved. We all want to be accepted. Socrates said, know thyself, it's actually the most difficult thing we'll ever probably do in life. But as I've gotten to know who I am better, um, I think I've fallen more and more into alignment with kind of my own true purpose and what I would like to do for the rest of my life. There's a global renaissance of understanding and awareness happening right now. And as people free their minds and their awareness and consciousness, consciousness lifts and perspective shift. And as the heart and the brain kind of merge together in this heart-brain consciousness, you're going to see only more and more and more of these new realizations for humanity. I think we're here because we're here to learn who we actually are. And that's the greatest encryption of all. That's epic, man. That one's new for me. I, I haven't seen that one yet you're asking. And, you know, just so people know who watch that, all of those images come from your personal 
um, notebooks, which, which are incredibly fascinating, man. I think you have probably whole libraries full by now. Yeah. In fact, I just, uh, posted on my website, um, about 25 images that for anyone who subscribes, they can download them all high res scans. They can download them all, all, download them all for free. And I'm about to post another 458 images just from this year. So all different pieces of art. It's kind of a mixture of art and science. And, and, um, and I, I, was, I was having my assistant, you know, scan all of them. And she tagged 458 of them for scan, which is like, I, <laughs> I don't even know how that happened, honestly. In this year, well, we can thank COVID for that probably because I was home a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, and people ask me like, well, do you ever watch TV? I'm like, actually, usually when I'm drawing this stuff, it's when my wife and I are sitting, sitting there watching television and I don't like to just sit and watch television. I like to follow along and I'm definitely not allowed to say, wait, what happened again? Um, but <laughs> so I don't, I don't do that. Now. I've learned, I've learned, uh, sometimes old dogs can learn new tricks. And, um, but yeah, I'm about to post all of those also that would be also available. Those won't be free, but, um, but you can, you can download them. You can even put them in like pictures I, and frame and everything. It's all part of the fulfillment thing. I'm really excited about launching this because I get questions about doing this all the time. And uh, so I, I, you know, like to be able to share these things with people. Of course, I share it all as I'm getting it on uh, Instagram and on Facebook, as you would have seen. So basically, uh, you know, I, I think that the, the whole world right now is really changing its viewpoint on what is, you know, what is mathematics and, and why, right? Why is that? Why are people changing? I mean, mathematics is the subject that most people love to hate uh, in school. And, and I kind of think of it, as I was explaining to you, like a bit like milk toast. Nobody likes to eat milk toast per se every single day if that's all you're forced to eat. But, um, you know, if you are capable of hating something, you're also capable of loving that thing. And there's a deep message inside of that, I believe. <clears throat> We're now living in a period of time where we all have to be forced to wear a mask in some way, shape, or form, whether we agree to it or not. And, um, and, and I think the point in time that we're in right now is to learn how to take off the metaphorical masks of who we are because we all create you know even the word mask means persona uh, in latin so persona is the word for mask so we create these like images of who we think we are and we want to show ourselves to the outside world when actually that's not truly the authentic self and then we judge all the things and other people that we don't like about ourselves and and this is where the world is and why this time seems so challenging and so difficult for so many people around the planet today. And many people like me are turning to the things that they hated before and now finding a different perspective to look at them in. And when you start looking at mathematics and geometry as a language of communication with the universe, um, you know, I really feel that way. I don't really even call myself a mathematician. I, I don't at all, which is kind of funny because I'm sure the people in the mathematics community uh, you know, they would like to say, that's not really mathematics that you're talking about or whatever. And yet I'm getting invited. I just got an invitation today to speak at a university um, with their math department, which is very interesting. I didn't even know. They went through my website, sent me an invite. <clears throat> so, you know, I am being asked to speak, but I think it's because I'm looking at the world mathematically from an entirely different perspective and viewpoint and that it is a language instead. And understanding that syntax, which I first presented at the uh, event we were at together in Egypt in 2017, and then since that time, I mean, geez, uh, if you're interested in, in the work, you can see it all on my website. There's literally so, so very much. Or you can follow it, uh, you know, a more consistently on a day-to-day -day basis. But what we, you know, thought of as mathematics is not really the mathematics that are parents or grandparents or their great grandparents learned. Now, I believe that the math that we're finding and learning today is actually the mathematics that was known at the time the Great Pyramid was actually built. And I believe this is ancient knowledge. Uh, and there's a lot that points me in that direction. And so, um, you know, we could take this a number of places. But I think one of the places I really want to touch on is, is Egypt. Yeah, I'd love for you to go there. Um, you know, the one thing I wanted to bring up was, you know, you were also featured in Thrive and Foster and Kimberly Gamble were both in Egypt as well. And, and this was a group of people really dedicated to finding solutions. 
And it's interesting when you see something like the pyramids or these ancient sites where you've been to many different ones yourself and you look at how many quote unquote sacred sites there are on the planet, there's thousands and we can't re we can't build them now. And they're so mind boggling, these amazing sites. And so there's a ton of information there, but there's all this math and knowledge encoded in these buildings. And it seems like you're also finding a correlation between uh, Leonardo da Vinci and the pyramids. And you talk about um, his, his uh, trip to Egypt as well. So yeah, let's dive into uh, some of the things you're discovering in Egypt. So let's start there. So, you know, I went back to Egypt in, um, in February of this year. And I had gone in, in, in May of 2018 and I discovered the Alpha Omega on the rim of the sarcophagus. And um, that was a shock for me. And I remember, you know, talking about that on one of your prior shows. And that, that was really stunning because when I saw the Alpha Omega on the rim, we're talking about the most studied building on the planet and the most studied room in the most studied building and the most studied piece of furniture. In fact, the only piece of furniture in the entire Great Pyramid, which is a 13 acre complex. And so um, it was just like, it's been since I was a child, this riddle wrapped in an enigma, right? It's, it's this complete mysterious thing. And nobody understands, even if they say they understand how the pyramid was built, nobody really knows. Let's, let's be real. I mean, it couldn't be built today. I'm 100% positive of that. And that's the only way you could prove if someone says they knew how to build it. Okay, so then rebuild it. I mean, we're talking about a building you know, these days we see new buildings that are taller than the last tallest building in the world are going up all the time, right? I mean, whether it's Dubai and the Burj building, or you're talking about the, the new tower that's gone up in, uh, in, uh, in Shanghai, <clears throat> the one in Malaysia, right? Uh, Kuala Lumpur or Singapore even, these very, very tall high-rise buildings going up. And um, when you consider the Great Pyramid was truly the tallest man-made building on the planet, not for two or three years, as is the case nowadays, right? Empire State was the tallest building in the world for a long time. But then we had the Twin Towers and everything after that. Now it's every other year, it seems like. 4,000 plus years. If you believe that the Great Pyramid was built 4,500 years ago, it was the tallest building on the planet for 4,000 years. Now, I happen to believe, uh, and I think I'm you know, joined by many, many other scholars and colleagues on this, that the Great Pyramid is actually much older than that. It might have been used by dynastic Egyptian 4,000, five years ago, but I believe the Great Pyramid is probably more like at least 13,000 years old and, and possibly even much older than that. So it, it causes you, and when you start to really study the mathematical constants that went into its construction, it causes you to really rethink all of the preconceived notions we all have about both time and space and light speed and everything because you'll find every measurement system built into the Great Pyramid. Every current measurement system and every ancient measurement system built in the proportional dimensions of the Great Pyramid. Now, we're not gonna have time to go through all the details on that, but I highly encourage people to go and look up Alan Green's work from the CPAC conference, CPAK, in 2016, where you can find a video that explains this and it's incredibly enlightening and it illuminates this entire topic. But now let's talk about Leonardo da Vinci, <clears throat> because this is an area uh, where you know, may have seen this video that Alan and I made about a year ago, uh, which was on the Vitruvian Man, and how when we place the, the pyramid in this position, first of all, when the Vitruvian Man has his hands out, you'll see where his fingers point, that turns out to be exactly an angle of 51.84 degrees, which is the very unique slope angle and which defines the entire pyramid complex today. Talk about the Great Pyramid in Giza. The original name for Giza was Rostow. Well, we found that when we placed that on top of the Vitruvian Man, that the location of each of the chambers inside the Great Pyramid is matching up with horizontal lines that da Vinci very conspicuously left on the Vitruvian Man sketch, okay, which was made, we believe, sometime in 1486. Now, we also have very strong reason to believe that da Vinci went to Egypt himself. Otherwise, how would he have known these things about the chambers? Because you know, this should not have been information that any average person would have known at all. So with that, I'm gonna share. <clears throat> all right. So this is from a book called uh, The Codice Atlantica, which is a collection of Leonardo da Vinci's work uh, that I happen to have purchased 
um, in, in the Vatican at the Leonardo da Vinci Museum. And it's a very expensive book and very rare prints uh, done of it. And it weighs like, you know, 50 pounds or so. It's a heavy, heavy book. It's huge. <laughs> and <clears throat> so I found that there's a, there's a letter inside this, uh, this book that is titled to the Sultan of the Devit Dar of Cairo, right? And it says Cairo, Babylon. And, and inside this letter, it basically chronicles the story of Leonardo da Vinci working for the lieutenant or Devitdar of the, the Sultan of, of Cairo, Babylon. And, and he worked as an engineer uh, during this time period. Now this particular Sultan was a pretty famous guy named Sultan Kate Bay. And he had a lot of connections to Europe. So this would have been during the Mamluk Sultans during the Ottoman Empire. So, you know, the Mamluks, uh, and the word Mamluk actually means bodyguard, interestingly, right? So this was like a bodyguard culture, and they were based um, out of uh, the, the Cairo area. And there was a fort there, and the fort was actually called Babylon, and it still exists today. There's a place called Babylon in Cairo, and it's a fort. So from da Vinci's own hand, and this is not chronicled in any of the biographies that have been written about Leonardo da Vinci, you won't find it. Uh, and, and in particular, you know, I, I recently read Walter Isaacson's work, biographical work on Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci's life, which was very, very well done, but missing a whole segment. And there are these missing years in Leonardo da Vinci's life that um, we don't have any record of. And so Leonardo basically chronicles his trip down to Cairo and how he even went through the Taurus Mountains, which is a, a range in Turkey. <clears throat> and he says, at last we reach Babylon. But this is not that Babylon which stood on the further shore of the River Chobur, which would have been in Iraq today, right? Where you would think of kind of like you know, Baghdad area. But that which is called the Egyptian Babylon, it is close by Cairo and the twain are but one and not two towns. This is straight from the hand of Leonardo da Vinci. And, and the fact that he wrote it is not disputed by art historians at all. Uh, what is disputed is they believe this is some sort of fictional account even though it's written in the format of a draft letter with a lot of detail that you would see is, why would he do this? Why would he write all this? So further, he says that the peaks of the great Mount Taurus. Now on the same letter, he chronicles the trip that he made through the Taurus mountains. <clears throat> and Taurus of course means bull. And there are Taurus mountains in Turkey and Armenia. And so he says, the peaks of the great Taurus, Mount Taurus, these peaks are of such a height that they seem to touch the sky. And in all the world, there is no part of the earth higher than its summit. And the rays of the sun always fall upon it on its east side for four hours before daytime. And being of the whitest stone, the Taurus mountains consist in great part of limestone. It shines resplendently and fulfills the function to these. So most people think that this is a reference to the Taurus Mountains in Turkey. Well, my colleague, Alan Green and I believe this is very clearly a reference. Uh, first of all, talking about limestone, super, uh, you know, shining resplendently and having daytime on both sides, telling us effectively that it's facing due north, right? The pyramid complex is facing due north. This is an encryption for the Ross Tau pyramids, which is Ross Tau is basically the, the Taurus, you know, taking the two syllables and flipping them around. Tauros, so T-A-U-R-O-S would be the way that we look at and say Taurus in Greek. And of course, the Greeks had control, you know, with, uh, you know, the, the Ptolemies, uh, which had, you know, a lot of power and were the ruling families that basically had control over Egypt for several hundred years. Uh, from the time of Alexander the Great all the way through to Cleopatra. Okay, so here's da Vinci saying he arrived in Cairo and then he's talking about visiting the Taurus Mountains, right, that are seem to touch the sky. Okay, then he goes on to say, among the gloomy rocks <clears throat> I came to the entrance of a great cavern in front of which I stood some time astonished and unaware of such a thing Bending my back into an arch, I rested my left hand on my knee and held my right hand over my downcast and contracted eyebrows, often bending first one way and then the other 
to see whether I could discover anything inside. And this being forbidden by the deep darkness within, and after having remained there for some time, two contrary emotions arose in me, fear and desire. Fear of the threatening dark cavern inside this mountain, and desire to see whether there were any marvelous thing within it. Now, let's go back for just a second. This is the original entryway into the Great Pyramid. And it's a little bit higher up. So if you were to imagine, Matt, where we entered, it's actually the, uh, the, the entry place over here, which was by um, you know, uh, one of the, uh, this was in the ninth century, when Al, uh, Khalid al-Mamun basically broke into the pyramid and they, they, they exploded out segments of it and they you know, excavated it out and then they found the ascending passage and, and they connected it there. So where most people enter into today is through there. They no longer enter through this original entrance, which has these two chevrons on top of it, right? You can see the two chevrons. And there's a basin here that looks like an altar. And written inside this, there's actually uh, four letters, which say Devere. Now, those four letters are written in a proto-Hebraic tongue. And uh, they were first recorded by a uh, geologist and Egyptologist Robert Schock. And interesting that it's Devere because Devere is the original word of the Holy of Holies inside Solomon's temple, which means the word of God, right? And it's written right in here. And I, if I have time, I'll show you some of the pictures of that. But these two chevrons actually mean Bull Mountain, Taurus Mountain. This is the, the original name of the Great Pyramid is the Bull Mountain. And this is what was sent to me by Muhammad Ibrahim, who is the, uh, you know, he's an expert in hieroglyphics. And, and he said, you know, the, the pyramid in our language has always been referred to as Bull Mountain. So here's Leonardo da Vinci making reference to Bull Mountain on several occasions inside of this. And now talking about the King's Chamber. Well, the King's Chamber has an entry ray off to the right that you can't see in this picture that is only 39 inches high. So that's about the height of a bar when you put a beer on a bar or something, right? Well, that 39 inches means that you kind of have to slouch over. You're still on your feet. You're not crawling to get into the king's chamber. And you've been through it so you know, and then there's like an antechamber inside there where you can play with sound and everything. And it really makes a strong resonance. So the two strongest places of resonance is in the antechamber there in that passageway that's about 24 feet long, okay? And then the other place that has incredible resonance is inside the king's chamber sarcophagus, right? So the, the coffer as it's often referred to. So the only way to walk through there is exactly as Leonardo describes. Bending my back into an arch, I rested my left hand on my knee and held my right hand over my downcast and contracted eyebrows, often bending one way and then the other. It's kind of like walking hunched over. He's exactly describing exactly the entryway into the king's chamber. And I remember the first time that I walked in there, I had an immediate feeling of two contrary emotions as well, desire and fear, right? There is something very powerful about that place, not only there, but also in the well underneath the Great Pyramid. And the well underneath, when you go into this tiny, tiny little shaft that's 56 feet long, and you crawl to the very end of it, and it's all limestone, and it's literally only like, you know, maybe 30 inches by 30 inches and it's the square that you're crawling into, it's super tight and super dark, like ridiculous dark. Did you go in there, Matt? Yeah, oh yeah, I was the first one in, <laughs> so there was people behind me. It was the, I've never seen, I've never experienced darkness like that. It's a whole nother thing. It's, it's, it's out of this world. And for a moment, and this is very famously written about by Drumbo and Melchizedek and several other people that have gone in there saying, you gotta be careful not to get too scared in there because whatever you think can actually manifest. And there's been like problems of people that got bit by snakes in there and everything. There's interesting stories that come out of there. It's a, it's a little bit like, not on the same level, I don't know about any deaths per se, maybe there were one or two, but it's kind of on the same level of, uh, of the, the, the myth that goes around around you know, King Tut's tomb when it was opened and there was a curse on that place. So there's some very strange thing about overcoming your fear that is associated with that particular chamber. And the last time I went, they actually closed it. So you can't go in there anymore right now. I, I don't know why. Oh, interesting. 
So, and I tried, I had, I had the pyramid, you know, I rented the pyramid for two nights and I tried to get in both nights and they would not let me in. So I, I don't know what that's all about. <clears throat> but Leonardo clearly is giving us references. So we kind of went off the context then that maybe there's more that Leonardo was trying to leave us about hints related to the Great Pyramid. And what was the job he was hired for? Why did Sultan Cape Bay, who was famously, you know, hiring European scholars to come, right? Why was Sultan Cape Bay actually showing uh, this interest in having Leonardo to come to Egypt and work for him as an engineer or an architect of some sort, right? So what I then found was, um, you know, we, we, we started looking at, you know, the Last Supper painting. And the Last Supper painting uh, is, is something very, very interesting because basically uh, you'll find in the Last Supper painting, I'll try to find some of the uh, pictures here. Oh, wrong one. Wrong one. So here we go. Okay, can you see that now? Yep. So the Last Supper painting <clears throat> is sort of famously this, and, and you could get much better, uh, you know, high res versions of this. But, and, you know, and, and of course we all know about this thing that relates to the Last Supper painting. And, and you know, there's this V that was in the, uh, uh, sort of this upside down V shape that represents that this is Mary Magdalene rather than being, uh, you know, John the apostle. And, and it's, it's the feminine, right? It's the feminine. So, but we found some other things in there as well in that, you know, this is exactly the phi relationship. So if you take the length of from where Jesus' hand on the left side, it's basically ending here and you have some crossover between the two. And then uh, Mary Magdalene ends right here. And this happens to be exactly a phi uh, relationship, which I, I, I found very interesting also. So uh, basically what we also found Follows. I'm glad you brought up this image because I've seen you post it and I was trying to figure out, it just looks amazing. I'm like, what am I actually looking at here? Right, <clears throat> exactly. So first of all, uh, my wife came on the trip with us and, and she became quite a, an archeologist and she probably made the biggest discovery on the trip which you know, I was very proud of her for that uh, because she's got a really good eye. And you know, this was really like a full on Indiana Jones thing. So if you, if you look at the Last <laughs> Supper uh, painting, and let me try to find a, a really good one for you to be able to pull up. I'm gonna go ahead and get the, uh, the full, you know, the, the full Monty version, Last Supper uh, high res. And you could look up the high res version on Wikipedia we go. All right. Bingo. All right. So I can help go back to this. And there we go. All right. So here's the Last Supper. And, <clears throat> you know, this is a, a very famous uh, painting that's in Milan, right? Now, most people, uh, probably wouldn't see some of the things that we noticed while we were there. So we were there on a kind of an adventure trip. We're trying to find this hidden, because all this stuff that I'd already talked about, we knew about before we went. And we were trying to find other references. You know, first of all, one thing that I had noticed was that the face of uh, Peter, which has his hand on the garment of Mary Magdalene, is actually the face of Leonardo da Vinci, which is very interesting. Why would he put his hand down Mary Magdalene's blouse, and why is he holding a knife behind his back right here, too? Hmm. You see that? Ever mm -hmm. noticed that before, Matt? No. <clears throat> and he's holding it in a way where you could construe that the hand is actually Mary's hand, and he's got his hand wrapped around it, or you could construe it's his hand sort of contorted. Now, what's also interesting about this is you've got Ju Judas in between the two of them, 
holding the bag of silver, right? This is the bag of silver, the 30, uh, you know, the, the 30 pieces of silver that he sold Jesus for, right? And it almost looks as if you've got Peter conspiring with Judah and Mary Magdalene. Isn't that interesting? And then you've got these guys over here, two of the other apostles, looking down at them, like saying, I don't want anything to do with this. You notice this? Yeah, yeah, you can see it. Yep. So, but I noticed something else totally different. And that is that the, the top of, above Jesus, is not only this very famous window, but also there is right above his right eye, you just follow his right eye all the way up, you'll see another eye sitting right inside here. And you'll see inside of this pediment above the window, what looks like almost a cat eye. Can you see that? Yeah, it definitely looks like one of the Egyptian eyes. <clears throat> right. So it looks like an eye of Ra, mm -hmm. which is interesting because Jesus is supposed to be the son of God, right? And his representation is eye of Ra. Now, if I continue to zoom in on this, you'll be able to see there's even writing on here. You can see R, E, right? And, and then it looks like a little gamma symbol right here as well. And, and so there's also a, um, this is a reference to uh, Rex or Reg, right? And it looks like a G symbol down here. Now in Italian, this is a reference to King. So it means King, like Regal. It's the same thing, like it means to be Regal. And you've got this gamma symbol. And so I'm like, why is there all this writing up here? Can you see this R right here, Matt? This one's pretty hard to make out from my screen anyway. It might be bigger or better for the other ones. Yeah, you have to kind of download it uh, in, uh, off the internet and you'll see it. There's a big E right here as well. And there's actually a bunch of writing on here. The so e, I, I can out, see the ear clearly, E clearly. You can see the E, you can see yeah. the e right here? Yeah. yeah. Now remember, this is painted, right, as a fresco. In order for there to be this perfect, looks like an perfect R and an E, lowercase, and then looks like a G underneath it. In order for this to be there, you, you kind of have to paint it exactly, right? There's no way that it's gonna end up like this. Now you'll also notice that on this back wall that there is, <clears throat> there's more stuff. I'm trying to like zoom out of this now. No, it's not letting me. Here we go. You'll notice also that there's an A right here. Do you see this A on the back uh, wall? Not clearly, just because uh, the, the screen I'm getting. So there's an A right here, <clears throat> and there's all kinds of stuff. So that I, I can look even on the right side. Do you see these letters right here? These are Hebrew letters. Oh, it's funny too. Yeah, I can see the letters, and I saw the A after you pointed it out. Kind of like one of those uh, weird paintings that you get, you know, and you, you cross, your, cross your eyes. Like, oh, well, as soon as you point it out, it becomes obvious. Yep, and you can see also numbers here that say 246. Two, four, six, right along this top part of this tapestry here. There's something written here in Hebrew that continues over here as well, right? So what, what is this stuff? And, and we started noticing a lot of other stuff too. First of all, there's all kinds of like um, things that we found all over the place like this H9. You see this? There's a letter H right here and then a nine right next to it. Oh, yep, yep. You see that? Okay. Yep. We also then noticed that this, of course, painting right here is actually of a holy grail. Oh, yeah, wow. And it's actually half of an omega on its side. So imagine this circle is completed. There's an omega right there. So what else could we see here? Well, then someone else noticed, and we're all noticing this while it's up on the screen, because we're all looking for things now, right? Well, look at this. You can actually see as well that there's something else on this wall, right? So inside the tapestry, you can even see here a, a Renaissance style letter A. So it's kind of a curvy letter A. And then it has a Q right here, a Q and a W. So that is Alpha Chi Omega. A W is the lowercase form of Omega, okay? So I'll, if I zoom out, you can kind of see it right here, even better, right? So here's the Alpha Chi 
omega. We also notice that there's a cow, right, hidden inside this tapestry, right over here where my cursor is. Can you see my cursor? Yep. So I'm gonna trace the cow's head. So here's the horns, two horns going up like this, and here's the outside of its head. Here's an oh, yeah. eye, here's another eye, here's two nostrils. You see that? Mm -hmm. And then this line right here is the ridge of its back. Can you see that line? And it extends all the way across the next tapestry over to here. You see that? Faintly. So here's the horns. The horns are definitely clear. I see his head pretty well. Yep, you see his head. And see, this is his eye, this is his left eye, this is the right eye, right? And then there's something else down here that looks like it's got an eye, another eye, and two nostrils and horns over here, and even a Taurus symbol hidden right inside of the center here, right? And it's hard to see, granted, right? It's definitely hard to see. But now you can look again, you'll see this alpha, Q, lowercase omega, right? So, um, so just keep that in mind. Now look, you'll find another H9 up here too. Do you see this? I don't know where you're looking. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, right in the far, far upper left-hand corner. Oh, yep. There's an H9 again. There's mm -hmm. H9s all over this, right? Literally H9s all over the place on this thing. And, and why is that, right? That's interesting. Another thing we noticed was this, <clears throat> this lamp here, which is like probably some sort of reference to, you know, having oil in your lamps from the Bible. And then the other thing we noticed was that up in the top of the rafters, you could see a lot of eyes looking down through the rafters, right? So you could see like an eyeball looking down and another eyeball looking at several different places here. And when you, there's an eyeball right here, right? Can you see that? And another eye right here looking down, hmm. right? And there's eyeballs all over it. So I've actually marked all, there's another one here, another one here. And it's kind of spooky because you're like, what in the heck is he trying to say? But that's kind of a, a common technique to kind of look, you know, have eyes looking down at people. But when you start looking at this back wall, you notice there's a lot of writing and it almost looks like there's script there. Can you see like there's lots of script kind of looking writing all across the back. So you really need to look at this in detail. Another thing we noticed was that you could see the profile of a lion right here. And there's also his back. There's also what look like eyelashes right along the top of this pediment, right? Of this eye of Ra. So this was really astounding for us, right? We started noticing these things. And, and of course, the thing that begs the biggest question is what the heck is this thing right here? Why is this thing even in the picture, right? Why does it look like it's so out of place on the wall in the chapel in Milan? So you've got everyone's feet here, but in front of Jesus, this is covering up Jesus. What is this thing, right? Can you know you see what I'm talking about? This thing in front that's got even a different color. It doesn't look like it's even part of the Last Supper painting, right? Yeah, and it's the only thing in the image that's um, that plain in color. You know, everything is kind of blended. So with what you're looking at, it's interesting because some of the letters are really clear. Some of them you kind of got to look at, and I guess it could be left for interpretation. But you know, kind of like if you're looking at clouds or something. But some of it is is really obvious. And so yeah, right. there's, there's all these clues in there. So yeah, what is going on? Why? It seems like he would be definitely putting a lot of that in there deliberately. And so that would be my question, you know, what, what is he trying to show? What, what's the, what's the point of that? Right. Exactly. What is the point of that? So you're know, going that, back to, so this, this coming back, can you see this now? Yep. Okay. So this is that same. So all I've done is trace that exact line of the alpha, Q, W, right? Mm -hmm. Which is Alpha Chi Omega. And then you see the trace of exactly the bull, right? And the cow. So you can see this is the version of it that has no writing on it. So now you can see where all the trace lines are. And of course, this is encrypted. So it's not supposed to be easy to see. That's kind of the whole point, <laughs> okay? If it was supposed to be easy to see, then it's like, dude, that's kind of like missing the point. So you see the eye position right here, right? I can All see the top the image, but I can't see the bottom image. Well, so the bottom image, right, is just exactly the same thing. So these are the same images. This has trace lines on it, so you can reference. 
So, yep. so follow this line, see this line right here on the back? Yep. Right here, the line is right here on the back. So then follow the rest of it and train your eye and you'll see the horns, right? So the horns, just like on this, see the horns right here, follow that line, the horns right here, here's the head that you said you could see, and here's the two nostrils and the eye, right? So that's what this is basically showing. And sometimes it's easier when you're a little bit farther away to actually see it, right? But we're talking about seeing a really, really delicate encryption. Now, What's interesting <clears throat> about this is that I'm gonna find this. Uh, I guess it's a good time to bring up that you do have an encryption company. That's one of the most advanced encryption companies out there. So, yeah, <laughs> the way that yeah, your I, mind I, is working I, and operating, like, wait, what? What are you doing? And you know, it's interesting too, though. Like going to the pyramid, it's like uh, mystery after mystery, and um, just the amount of information that is encoded in that place is, is unbelievable. Looking at Alan Green's work, uh, listening to you guys from the resident science foundation and all the discoveries that continue to happen. And you were even saying before the show, how you um, got to see some of the underground I've heard, you know, the Egypt is supposed to be like 10% is above ground, but there's these, all these underground tunnels and cities and all this, um, all this, stuff down there and they haven't even excavated it no one's been down there it, ha it hasn't even been explored and so you got to wonder what is down there right right totally so uh this is actually a picture of um the king's chamber it's also got this other overlay on it i need to take off the other overlay but that's related to another work which is all the colors it's a longer presentation but when you take the picture of the of the room itself of the king's chamber and you overlay it on top of the Last Supper painting where the back wall matches up, right? It ends up having the exact same reference for the Last Supper itself. And the floor ends up in the same spot. And what's very interesting is that the sarcophagus ends up being right over that weird thing that nobody understands why Da Vinci left that there. You see that? Yeah, wow. <clears throat> Right, so it's like, wait a minute, that's giving us a whole nother reference point on what is the Last Supper painting all about. And now we've seen that cow, right? We've seen the Eye of Ra, <clears throat> two prominent things showing up. So this was the night, the last night we were in the King's Chamber. And this is a, a video that we took where my wife Susie actually discovered uh, something on the right wall in exactly the same spot as the tapestry. Discovery. Go ahead. Well, we just found something else here in the King's Chamber. There's a bowl here. There's the face, but horn, horn, body. And then something here. They don't have that one. Come on, second, one second. Wow. I am blown away. So now, what we also learned is if there's a larger cow, we didn't see this until after we were examining all the video and stuff. There's a larger cow surrounding a smaller bull, right? So you've got the bull that, that Susie pointed out here. There's a larger cow around it. You can see the eye right here and the horns here, and it stretches about eight feet. This is very large on the wall. And, and inside this, this bull is this heart-shaped sort of thing. Right, which is very interesting because in Egyptian myth, legend, the, the word alpha is derived from the word aleph, which means bull. Okay, so alpha means bull. Uh, and, and, and so it's principally from the word apis bull. So the apis bull is a story about how the apis bull, which was the boy, sacrificed himself to merge back into his mother, the Hathor. And the Hathor is represented by the Omega symbol. And it looks just like an Ankh, right? When the two come together, it becomes an Ankh. Now, what's very interesting as well is that the surface of the sarcophagus is where I found the Alpha Omega a year you know, before, so in 2018. So now we're seeing a cow that is represented by the Omega and a bull inside that cow. So a mother and her son. So very, very interesting, right, symbology. 
So effectively, uh, you know, as we were looking at all of this, you know, this is another picture you could see where you could see the bull that Susie's pointing out. And there's that heart section right in here too. And it looks like there's even been some writing on here. In fact, if you really look at it in some of the photographs, you could actually see lots and lots of writing that was previously there. And yeah, you, you know what this reminds me of is, is the uh, ancient cave paintings. Those things, I, I don't even, I can't remember how old those are supposed to be, but the, the really ancient uh, oldest cave paintings on the planet. Um, I did a show, I can't even remember the guest's name, but you know, he would study them for years and has these presentations on them. And the more he looks at them, he said, every time I study them, I find new information and new correlations. And as he was drawing it out and showing it to me, I was having trouble seeing it. But then he would, you know, he had the slide all ready to go and he outlined it. And the second he did, um, I was able to understand and see exactly what he was sharing. And so um, maybe they were doing some sort of thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, what we believe is that, <clears throat> and we found this in many of the paintings now for, by Da Vinci, uh, there's another painting uh, which basically points to uh, this as well, which is uh, something called the La Belle Ferronière. Okay, so La Belle Ferronière. So this is a, this is a painting that Nobody really knew, you know, who the subject of this painting was. We believe that it was actually Anne Boleyn. And there's many art historians now that also believe that. This was a painting of Anne Boleyn. Now, why would Leonardo da Vinci paint Anne Boleyn? Well, because they lived in the same house for three years together, from 1516 until 1519, the year that Leonardo died. And this happens to be the, the mother of Queen Elizabeth the I. And you know, so there possibly is some connection between the work of the Rosicrucians, which were, you know, purportedly in part founded by Leonardo da Vinci, uh, and then the Rosicrucians that came into England, which included, you know, uh, the person that is known to be William Shakespeare, potentially. So some people think it's, it's Bacon. Some people believe, uh, as we believe, that it's uh, predominantly Edward de Vere. There's probably a collection of people, but Edward de Vere is one. Interesting, the name de Vere again coming out. And, and so I had noticed looking at this painting that there was something around Anne Boleyn's head. And by the way, Bolin is uh, the, the meaning of Bolin, which is a Flemish name, means bull, Anne Boleyn. So, uh, and Edward de Vere was the 17th Earl of Oxford as well, the, the, uh, the bull crossing. So effectively, you see here that there's some sort of shape that looks kind of like a petal of some sort, or maybe an eye even, but facing the opposite direction. Can you see this, Matt? Yeah, a little bit. And you know what this is reminding me? I watched Alan Green's presentation on uh, the, mystery, the mystery around Shakespeare and yeah. all of the encoding that's going on there. And when you watch Alan Green stuff, you're just like, holy smokes, you know, how, how deep does this rabbit hole go? So it's interesting that this is potentially connected to Shakespeare as well. Oh, absolutely. So, so basically what I noticed was that there's an eye of raw on top of Jesus inside of uh, the, the Last Supper painting. And then there's an eye of Horus on top of Anne Boleyn, a feminine character and known to be a very, very enchanting feminine character, right? She was the mistress of the King of France. Actually, her sister was as well. And what you'll actually see is, as I started noticing as well, that as I sort of zoom out of this, you can even see it a little bit better. But as you zoom out of this, you'll notice that not only is there an eye, but there's also a strange looking face with a nose right here, two nostrils, right? And then it looks like a tongue of a cat. So it looks like a lion head. And that this eye over Anne Boleyn's head is that of a lion. Now, that's really interesting because it looks like a lion man. Well, Leonardo in Italian actually means lion man. So we now have the eye of Horus, which is the left eye, the missing left eye of Horus. And it's so pronounced, even you can notice where the iris would be inside this eye is right on her hairline that is made to look like a brown iris. You see this 
light that's basically coming off her eye. It looks like an iris. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So we believe that there are many paintings uh, connected. We're making a film on this uh, that basically tells this whole story. And, um, you know, we, 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 of course, then started looking for all these things. And we found the cow and the bull on the right wall, right, looking at the sarcophagus. And then we also found this. So this is the king's chamber. <clears throat> And you could see the eye above Jesus, which we already saw. It looks like a cat eye, doesn't it? it looks like a cat eye. It's got that mm -hmm. same kind of slit for a pupil. And, and then you could see even the eye, eye, eyelashes that were basically delicately painted by Leonardo right here. That I showed you already where there was a, you know, writing where you could see that R-E. And you said you saw the E. Right. Yeah, and you know, I just want to kind of bring up too because um, you know I can hear like in some people's mind they'd be like, okay, you know, um, maybe that's just the way that the paint would go, or it's a bit of a stretch. You know, you could say that as as you know a possibility in a theory, but at the other at the other side of it, the level of mastery of painting that he had and and other things like you know I. I understood, I didn't understand painting at all until I went to a, a Van Gogh museum and realized how amazing they are. So you can only just imagine like how incredible he was at painting. And if there's any distinction or any um, variation, the chances of it being deliberate are higher than it being random. You know, the chances of it being oh, yeah. a random well, shape. And we're talking random, about we're talking about Leonardo da Vinci, who famously exactly. encrypted everything. Yeah, 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 exactly. So from that lens, um, that's, I feel like, what, what people need to really be observing this. And then you're also connecting it to mathematics and the pyramid, which is a another whole um, ballgame. Um, I'll let you continue. I just want you to know it's a 540 sure. now. I know, I know, you're, yep. I know um, you've got other, other business, so I'll just kind of remind sure. you of the sure. time. Sure. So I'll show you this one last piece here. So here's the eye, and then if we look on the exact same wall in the same spot, right, and slightly adjust the image for our height and everything so you've got exactly the same perspective on it, you'll see what looks like the faint trace of an eye of Ra. Yeah. Right on the exact same spot. And here's another photograph of it. This time you've got the trace line up on above, and then on the bottom you'll see this line, right, and trace the exact same thing. So you can see this line right here that goes all the way across. And then you've got the, the iris and pupil right in the center here. So we don't know if the walls were scrubbed or cleaned or what, right? But the King's Chamber is famously without, it's supposed to be without any reliefs. There's not supposed to be any like stuff on the walls or anything of the sort. And yet we're finding these things. So, um, I think that there's a, a much bigger story to be told here related to Leonardo in particular, and that he spent time, we know he spent time in Egypt. So this is a very exciting, a very exciting thread that we're basically pulling on now. And, uh, you know, we are doing a lot more research, but, you know, when, when we discovered this and several other things, uh, we, we got very, very excited about it. So we can go ahead and go to the next, uh, next topic now, if you like, but, that's basically where. Well, it's, it's, it's really, really fascinating stuff. I guess my question with that would be, you know, what, what do you believe the point would be in encoding this information? You know, when we went to Egypt and we're discovering all these things, my perception would be um, information that is left behind for us to utilize when we reach a certain point like clues for us to kind of uh, help our own journey. And why do you think that Leonardo would leave those clues and, and where do you think they're leading? Well, I think it comes back down to, you know, this, um, we actually did a, a very short film on this that explains it. And I think it, it probably does the very best job of, of explaining it. Um, and you can find it actually on YouTube. And uh, it's basically called the Real Da Vinci Code. And I'll just fast forward to the segment where, um, where we talk about this. Okay. So here we go. The iconic Vitruvian man, drawn circa 
great Leonardo da Vinci. It's probably the most famous image of all time. And yet for over five centuries, no one has noticed he encoded within it astounding knowledge of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Polymath Robert Grant recently observed that the angle from the navel to the top corner of the square exactly matches the side slope angle of the pyramid. Aware that his cryptologist friend, Alan Green, had discovered precision sacred geometry connections to the pyramid hidden in the cover of Shakespeare's sonnets, Grant asked him to investigate da Vinci's masterpiece with the same mathematical rigor. What they found challenges our entire concept of what this enigmatic work of art is really about. It's widely known that the Great Pyramid embodies the ratio of the radiuses of the Earth and Moon. But Green realized that by inscribing a circle within da Vinci's square and raising that circle so its center coincides with the center of the Vitruvian Man circle at the navel, six perfect pyramid cross sections are revealed, along with an exact geometrical match of the Earth-Moon pyramid relationship. Da Vinci states explicitly in the backwards mirrored text surrounding his image that its proportions are exact integer ratios of the whole man. And he's cut his man in 14 places, clearly identifying those proportions. In addition, he says, decrease the height of man by 1 14th, a second veiled reference to the Horus Eye myth in which Set cuts Osiris' body into 14 parts. Now, the magic. Da Vinci's lines reveal a perfect blueprint of the internal structure of the pyramid's chambers. Only the queen's chamber seems to be missing. But is it? Queen Isis, mourning the cutting of her husband's body into 14 parts, represents the 14 phases of the waning moon. Her reconstituting Osiris body represents the 14 phases of the waxing moon. Da Vinci has precisely identified the presently known subterranean queen's and king's chambers the ground level of the pyramid, its defining side angle, and its mathematical relationship to Earth and Moon, centuries before these were supposedly known. Which begs the question, do his upper lines represent presently unknown chambers? Da Vinci seems to be telling us the Great Pyramid hides a deeper esoteric symbolism than has ever been suspected a blueprint of man's unfolding spiritual journey through the sacred energy centers in the spine known as the chakras. Perhaps finding these inner chambers in ourselves is our ultimate purpose and the Great Pyramid, but a metaphor for the true measure of mankind. Oh dear man, my every time I talk to you, my mind just gets uh, blown, and uh, and seeing that uh, end shot of Egypt, it just brought me back there because that place is just so unbelievable. It's hard to put into words. Like you know, one of the things that of all the amazing things, it just blew my mind. But you know, they had a casing stone, and so those pyramids, full power with the casing stone outside, perfectly flat. I'm so curious who built those, what they were for, um, and you know, everything that is left to be revealed from that place and people like Da Vinci. Um, I could talk to you all day, talk to you for hours. Um, what I'll leave you with is um, where do you think 
we are going with this type of information. You know, you've got, you, you are a part of Thrive too. I like what they're doing there. They're kind of saying, hey, here's our, some of the problems that we have in our world, um, but here are some solutions. And with your mathematics, with the evolution of just our species, you know, the, the um, evolving technology and our capabilities, if we can find peace as a species, begin to work together and start to collaborate in mathematics and engineering and physics. I think the sky is the limit, space travel, all of that stuff becomes possible, but we have to become a cooperative species first. And I'm just curious, how do you see the trajectory of mankind um, coming with your work and what you're doing? So I, I think we all spend time focused on the world outside of ourselves. From the moment we're born, we think that we somehow are on some journey to find the answers and that we are separate from the rest of the world. I think ultimately what the world is going through right now is learning how to go inside. And I think that the whole COVID situation, obviously it's been very difficult on many levels, but with you know difficulty always comes opportunity also. The opportunity for some has been that they have like dived into themselves to find the answers. I personally believe that the world is not a difficult place because people don't like each other. I think the reason why the world can be a difficult place is because people don't like themselves. And I think the major journey that we're all on right now is learning how to come to terms with ourselves, our shadows, um, all of the things that we want to deny in ourselves and only point out in judgment of other people. And I, I think that's what will change the world. Uh, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. And I think that's what this journey is all about. I think that's what Leonardo is trying to tell us, that as we start to learn to accept who we are and accept ourselves, then the world around us will evolve and change dramatically. And it already is. Let's face it. The, the pace of change right now, we could say that there's so much weird stuff going on in the world, and you could focus on all the weird stuff and the bad stuff and all that. Or instead, you can shift your perspective and look at it and see how people are waking up all over the planet right now. There is a great renaissance happening right now. And, and I think that is the ultimate message, that the answer is not that we're gonna, I mean, I think it'll be great when we have things like free energy and you know that we can travel to other planets and all of that, but maybe the answers to those very difficult and vexing challenges are actually just by us understanding who we are. And once you start to understand who we are, then you stop perceiving yourself as separate from the rest of the world. And you start practicing empathy. I think the answer is not through the brain. The answer is actually through the heart. And, and that's what all of the work that I've been getting and doing, you know, the mathematics that I've found, uh, I, I can take you through so much of different things, but it's probably not the forum or the format <clears throat> today to take you through very, very complex mathematics. It's just too much for people to basically synthesize and take in. If people are interested in doing that, you can. And you could go on my website or on Instagram or whatever and find literally hundreds and hundreds of hours to dive into this type of work, um, you know, including new geometries, including things like prime factorization, and which is so fundamental to time and perception, uh, and some really incredible new equations and new findings mathematically that are just like mind blowing. But the real answer to all of this, in my opinion, it's the journey into the self. And as we become comfortable with ourselves and learn to love ourselves and accept ourselves just as how we are without condition, we will then tr transcend and start to treat everyone else around us in the same way, in the same light. Learning acceptance is the big thing the world needs right now. And it's all through the heart. Wow, very beautifully said. You know, I've, I've done the etymology of number uh, course. I understood some of it. Um, you made it as relatable as possible. Um, but yeah, the, the work and, and some of the things you think about are truly extraordinary. And I'm grateful you can take those lessons and, and bring it down to earth with a, with a an application that we can all understand and apply because whatever that expression is, if you start at that root, you know what I mean? That root of, of empathy and love for yourself and, uh, you know, tolerance for your fellow man, you know, from there you can build anything. And I think that the way that we get through this is together, not in like a slogan type of way, 
but in right. a, <laughs> but in a genuine way, you know, and and we we can. Yeah, you know, I, I just I love the example of Team Earth. Just imagine if you know China and uh, Canada and USA and Russia, we all work together, and we don't need governments or institutions or corporations for that to happen. We need people to see other people and work toward the same solutions. And so it's it's absolutely possible. So um, I think three aspects. You know, I'll end on this. I think three aspects of society are just no longer serving humanity um, anymore for our stage of evolution. And I, I think it's, the world has changed so much and so, so fast. I mean, today people are interested in education more than ever before. They, they want to learn, right? But they don't want to learn necessarily in universities and get degrees. Uh, more than ever, people are like lapping up videos on YouTube on math and physics and all that stuff, right? And you can get some of the best professors like, you know, Richard Feynman, uh, you, you can see, you know, or Leonard Susskind at Stanford. You can watch all of their lectures online now. It's incredible. So you think about where the world is today, and yet people don't want to go back and get more degrees. People want to have a sense of community cross-border. You know, I have people that follow my work in Iran and Kurdistan, all over the world, and they're vibing to a message and an ideology more than some national boundary or border. And I think this is a massive change. The fact that I can talk now to thousands of people all at once, you know, mankind hasn't been able to do that ever before in the way that it can today. And, you know, we're trying to put together a conference right now with the Dalai Lama and Nassim and I went and met with him in India back in, uh, in October of last year. It was an incredible trip. You know, I took the scientific delegation. We were teaching the Dalai Lama, you know, contemporary understanding of mathematics and physics. Wow. And you know, we spent five and a half hours with it. It was incredible. Like one of the most, you know, pinnacle moments, I guess, in life that, you, that someone could have. But I still feel like the best is still yet to come. And I think the world, you know, while we chide against the education system, while we chide against uh, governments, you know, people all want to participate in community, but don't really want anything to do with government. That's another problem right now. People are tired of the polarity. The number of people that declare unregistered voter from the perspective of, you know, not affiliating with any party is at all time highs here in the United States. Something like 42% of the population affiliates with neither Democrats or Republicans. That's also very unique. So, all of these things, you know, these structures in society that intend to tell us what is right and what is wrong, what is lawful and what is unlawful, what is truthful and what is, you know, uh, mistruthful, what are mistruths, what is moral and what is immoral, religious structures. These structures that were intended to become the arbiters of those different categories of society's viewpoint and perspective on things are now crashing. They're coming down. And... This was happening prior to COVID. COVID was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. And now we're seeing countries like the United States literally buckle under the pressure of, you know, a crisis like this that has like brought us to our existential knees. And that's kind of amazing. But really the issue is, is that no army can resist the power of an idea whose time has come. That is a quote by Victor Hugo. You know, people think ideas can't change the world. Ideologies don't have the way to change the world. Or small groups of people can't change the world. Margaret Mead said, it's the only thing that ever has. And I think that is what's happening right now. We're in the, in, in the stream, in the current of a major global change. It's a revolution of thought, ideology, individualism. And the structures that we have that mean to tell us what is good and bad, what is right and wrong, what is moral and what is immoral, what are the structures, and then we start realizing that really what's behind all of those judgments is really just their own self-interest. As we peel back the masks for society, we all wake up. So I fundamentally believe that this period of time is meant to be. And I'm excited for the next evolution. And the best is yet to come. So it's difficult at times because we kind of have to sit back and say, whoa, Nelly, we got to just like, surrender to the universe and trust that the universe knows what it's doing. And I believe that. 
Amazing, ma'am. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for your work. Uh, if people want to f- find you, follow you, Robert Grant, Robert Edward Grant on Instagram. I think that's your domain as well, robertgrant.com. Right. And on, on Facebook and on YouTube, I have a channel also. So there's lots of ways you can find me. But, um, you know, usually I'm in my, uh, my living room or in my office at home drawing something or working on math these days. And I, I enjoy every minute of it. So thanks very much, Matt. Good to see you. And I'll look forward to seeing you again next time. Sounds good, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks guys for watching. See you in the next one. Peace.